People are throwing public tantrums because they're getting paid. We pay them in likes, retweets, and hand-clapping emojis. We are swimming in histrionics, the behaviors, and the people. Where is this train taking us, and how can we get off? From emotional blackmail and suicide threats on social media to politicians like AOC accusing colleagues of hiring hitmen to bump her off, our public conversation is nothing but histrionic people throwing histrionic fits. And they're going to keep it up as long as we keep paying them. On today's show, we're going to call bullshit on the marketplace of bootleg knockoff victimhood. I'm Joshua Slocum, and this is Disaffected. This show is about abuse dynamics that you may recognize from your personal life, you may recognize from discussions of domestic abuse or family abuse, and how these have seeped out into our public discourse and started to structure our interactions with each other, most acutely now on the social justice left. This week, we're going to talk about the documented rise in personality disorders and personality disorder traits over the past 20 to 30 years. I'm going to spend some time talking about histrionics, the overblown and melodramatic uh, inflation of emotion uh, that people use as social currency these days. And one of the best examples is our friend Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who is convinced that her Senate colleagues on the right are trying to get her killed. So let's just jump into it. I want to do a little bit of personal housekeeping first, though. About seven months ago, I decided to quit social media. So I got off Facebook. I'd been off Twitter for a while. I didn't do any of it. And I went back a couple of weeks ago, partially, of course, because I want to promote this show. So, but I was also interested in in checking in with my friends. You know, there were a lot of people I really missed. Social media got very overwhelming for me and it became an addiction. Uh, And if it becomes an addiction again, I'm going to cut myself off. But I'm going to see if I can engage with it with a, a lighter touch this time around. Well, It'll probably be surprising to none of you, but I didn't find that people's behavior has gotten any better or that their ability to think and dis- think about and discuss political issues with any nuances is, is not any better. So after logging back into Facebook this week and promoting the show with links, a very old college friend of mine uh, sent me a private message. Now, this is This story is not about what's wrong with him. This is not his fault. This is an example of what's wrong with the discourse on the left. So this old college friend messaged me, and this is somebody I've known for, gosh, almost 25 years now. We've done a lot of things together. We've had a lot of very good discussions. Uh, He, too, like me, has a mother with a cluster B personality disorder. And um, we have a lot of common experiences, and we've been able to help each other understand these things a lot better by by having this dialogue. And he sent me a message privately and he said, you know, I wanted to tell you this directly, but the firm that I work for in New York City is super woke. They take a super liberal approach on everything. And I'm responsible for doing a lot of their content and their promotion of this. And basically, if they see me consorting with somebody like you, and especially now that you have a podcast that you're going to have to publicize widely, my job is going to be in jeopardy. And he took the took the time and went to the trouble to tell me, you know, he didn't want to scuttle our friendship, and I hope we can still be friends. And I, I, I feel a little bit bad <laughs> uh, that he felt he had to say that, but I understand why he had to say it. And And the reality is, he's right. If he is seen palling around with me, he will be fired from his job. And I can't ask anyone individually to make that choice. I mean, some of us are going to have to make that choice. If we're going to get a grip on the public conversation and stop allowing the woke social justice left to shut us down, to cancel us, and to get us fired, some of us are going to have to stick our heads above the parapet and be a little brave and risk something. I'm taking a risk doing this show right now. I work in the nonprofit sector. I'm not advertising to my colleagues and my constituency at the organization that I work for uh, about this, but sooner or later they're going to find it. And um, I would bet that there's going to be some pressure from woke people within the constituency and also people who get gathered up into social media mobs. Um, you know, I'm taking a risk doing this show, but it's important and, and it has to be done. But, you know, it really, I was talking to another friend the other night. 
I am more scared of what's going on than I was in the lead up right to the election. Um, if we thought that the absence of Donald Trump was going to quiet down some of the over emoting and the pitchfork hysteria that the social justice left is engaged in, we were wrong. Uh, we've got a bunch of sore winners right now. I don't know what the left is going to do for the next one year, two years, four years, because without Donald Trump, um, they're going to have very little to talk about because they seem to need a boogeyman to play off of and define themselves. But right now, I think tensions are even higher than they were before. Another thing that happened when I logged back into Facebook was um, – I actually I told the story that I just told you here. I told the story about, you know, a very dear longtime college friend having to sever his, his public connection with me because of guilt by association. And I said, folks, this is the left today. And another liberal friend jumped in and got upset with me because I said that this was the fault of the left. It is the fault of the left. My friend works for a liberal organization. He works in Manhattan. You know how woke Manhattan people are. This is not a right-wing problem. It's not a right-wing conspiracy. It's happening on the left. And he was so angry at my pointing this out that he lost his temper with me and, and you know, got so really shirty with me on Facebook. Now, I will say that he emailed me afterward and apologized. Um, he crossed a line and and he took ownership of it and I was really delighted to get that email. I've had to send that email myself too. As I've said in past shows, social media itself is such an artificial form of communication that it can push anyone into cluster B type behaviors, melodramatic behaviors, black and white thinking, losing your temper. So I understand I've done that many times. That's why I cut myself off from social media. But it has not gotten better. And in fact, it feels a lot tenser to me uh, than things did even, even a few months ago. So this show, of course, as I've said, is about personality disorders. And, and it hangs really on the hook of my waking up five years ago to the fact that my mother has borderline and narcissistic personality disorders. Uh, and that that explained the crazy world that our family has lived in, in a way that nothing else had explained it before. And once I saw that, I began to see it happening everywhere on the public stage, and it alarmed me. So I think that we are living in a cluster B world. We are living in an era when public discourse and political discourse and even friendships operate on personality disorder rules or abuse dynamic rules. And until we grapple with that and we see it for what it really is, it's only going to get worse. And I'm not the only one who thinks this. Subjectively, right, I look around me and say, I see behavior from college students, from young people, and, and increasingly from older people, middle-aged people and older, that used to be considered behavior that you would only tolerate from a teenager. And you wouldn't tolerate it to the degree that we're tolerating it from grown adults right now. And I started looking into this, and there's a body of literature out there, both lay literature and professional psychiatric and psychological literature, that talks about the increase in personality disorders that, that researchers have documented. I've got a couple of articles here. One is from a guy named Bill Eddy. And if you are keeping a notebook, you might want to take a note of this. He is well worth your time. Bill Eddy is with an organization called the High Conflict Institute. They're a nonprofit that seeks to help professional organizations such as workplaces, corporations, churches, whoever it is, deal with what they call high conflict people. And high conflict people is another term usually for people with cluster B personality disorders. So if you are interested in looking at this from a professional development point of view or somebody who is used to hearing from people who say we've got a big HR problem, check out the High Conflict Institute and Bill Eddy's work there. So he, an article from 2018 that I pulled off their site is titled, Are Narcissists and Sociopaths Increasing? And Bill writes, Personality disorders are a significant but barely recognized public health problem in the United States and around the world. 
Two personality disorders in particular cause a great deal of disruption in the workplace, conflict in marital relationships, and are prevalent in criminal populations, and they appear to be increasing. And he goes back to 1994 um, in the DSM. The DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. So when I say DSM, I'm referring to that. It's basically the Diagnostic Bible of Mental Disorders, as it says, And it's used in a lot of ways to categorize, but also for insurance billing under the American system. So it has some uses and it has a lot of misuses as well. And it changes over time. Every 10 years or so, there's an effort to revisit what's in there and say, have we really categorized these things the right way? Do we need to make updates? This is all normal and healthy and and should be done in in a scientific publication or one that aspires to be scientific. So Bill went back to the 1994 DSM and talked about what researchers think the prevalence rate is for cluster B personality disorders. So how many people out in society have these disorders? So he says, in 1994, the fourth edition of the DSM estimates the prevalence of narcissistic personality disorder at, quote, less than 1% in the general population. Then on sociopaths, this is also called antisocial or psychopath, On sociopaths, it said the overall prevalence in community samples is about 3% in males and 1% in females. I've heard numbers like this before. With borderline, I've seen statistics that say, you know, 2 to 3% of the population. I can't give you studies, folks. I'm going on my gut, and my gut might be wrong. But I think the prevalence of cluster B in total it's probably closer to between 6 and 10%. Um, so what did, what did Bill find when he, when he looked at some more recent research? So he's looking at a large survey from the National Institutes of Health that was conducted between 2001 and 2005. Um, structured interviews were done with approximately 35,000 people who were randomly selected to be representative of the U.S. adult population. So what did they find? This study found that 6.2% of the population would meet the criteria for narcissistic personality disorder, and 3.7% would meet the criteria for antisocial sociopathy or psychopathy. And here Bill says, this could be seen as a huge jump for narcissistic personality disorder and a significant increase for antisocial personality disorder in about a decade. And there's, of course, the question of whether we are noticing and categorizing these things more completely and more accurately than we were before, or whether the incidence in the population really is is ticking up. And it's an open question. But Bill says this from his practical experience. Working as a family lawyer and a high-conflict consultant for the past 25 years, I have noticed the increasing problem of narcissistic personalities in high-conflict divorces. Their lack of empathy often involves extremely demeaning behavior and public statements toward their former spouse while using the children as a tool to enhance their public image. And getting to the conclusion, I'll just give you one more. After 30 years as a conflict resolution professional in many settings, I believe that narcissists and sociopaths are an increasing public health problem. I could not agree more. I've said this before, and I'll say it many more times. We hear a lot about public health crises, and a lot of these so-called crises are not crises at all. But if you ask me to use a word to describe this problem, I would say that the lack of public knowledge and discussion about the prevalence of cluster B disorders and what they do in families, political groups, churches, workplaces, and the polling booth is one of our most pressing public health crises. We don't talk about it. We don't have the language for it. We do have the language for it, but most people don't know what it is, and that's part of the reason behind this show. And it's not just the narcissists and the sociopaths, in my view. It's the borderlines and histrionics, too. And there is a difference between these. I've talked about this before. The cluster B personality disorders, the four of them, borderline, narcissism, histrionic, and antisocial, They are not all the same. 
and the prognosis for a person who gets into treatment uh, is better or worse depending on which one they're talking about. Overall, as a group, these are largely intractable problems that most people with them are not going to get over because part of the problem itself is that people with these disorders don't believe there's anything wrong with them. It's always somebody else. So if you can't get somebody to consider that it might be their cognitive distortions and it might be the way their personality has developed in terms of interpreting the outside world and assigning intent to other people, that that itself might be a problem. If you can't get them there, it's very unlikely that you're going to get them to accept that they need to take some steps to change themselves and that it is not, in fact, everyone else in their life who's always screwed them from the day they were born. So what happens when it's not necessarily narcissists and sociopaths, but it's borderlines and histrionics? So let's talk about histrionics, both the people and the behaviors. I'm going to tell you a couple of stories. And as you might expect, one of them is about Mommy Dearest, uh, but another one is uh, a case of my own histrionics. So maybe eight years ago, my mother was holding court in the living room. Uh, she would do this usually every day that I was around her. There would be some stories about somebody who did her wrong, usually her family. Could have been stories about her parents, might be stories about her brothers and sisters. Well, this time she was telling the story of um, how badly treated and neglected she was at a recent family gathering where a lot of her brothers and sisters and in-laws were there. And she... She said, they treated me like the black sheep of the family. Nobody mentioned me once. I wasn't even standing in line with my brother-in-law. It was like I wasn't even there. And then pause to cry and, and hunch her shoulders over and, and appear to be pitiful and then come back raging and saying, I don't know what the hell is wrong with these goddamn people, but they've never been worth a tinker's damn and da 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 So mother was... Absolutely betrayed. Nobody cared about her. She was treated like an outcast from the family. What kind of family gathering happened that she had this experience at? My 43-year-old aunt's funeral, her sister. This was my Aunt Mary Ellen's funeral, and she still had children who were young enough that they needed a mother. My mother was angry that nobody had mentioned her in Mary Ellen's eulogy, that nobody had asked her to speak. I, have, I wasn't at the funeral, so I have no idea uh, how people actually treated her, but I can tell you that uh, my mother can make up a melodrama about absolutely anything and claim that people were giving her dirty looks or they were turning their back on her. And you, would, you could stand there and you wouldn't necessarily see what my mother was seeing. She told these stories and she held court this way because that's how she got attention. That's how she got emotional validation. She would put on histrionics. She would claim to be excessively wounded. Um, her pain was so deep that, that you know, no one else could understand it. And she always seemed to have pain when she wasn't the center of attention. <laughs> and as I've said before... Um, we all do inherit things from our parents, and I inherited some things from my mother, and she taught me some too. Thanks, Ma. I had a histrionic fit five years ago, six years ago now, that, that I'm embarrassed about, but I'm not embarrassed enough not to tell you because it's worth, it's worth dragging this out into the light uh, because this can happen to any of us, um, and particularly on social media and particularly if you're caught up in the social justice world. So... Back in 2015, when the Supreme Court decided the, um, the gay rights question, I was on Facebook, still connected to a lot of people from the New Atheist Movement, still very much in social justice. And a couple of guys, a couple of straight guys who were friends of mine, were on a long thread on Facebook, and everybody was celebrating the victory for gay marriage. And these guys started telling jokes about how Oh, hey, John, we can finally get gay married. And then David would say, yeah, yeah, I've been waiting this whole time. Let's just go out there and get gay married like we always wanted to do. Da, da, da. They were just having fun, right? They were just having fun. I threw a fit. And 
I went full SJW meltdown and said, how dare you guys make light of this incredible, life-changing, historic moment that all of us gay people have fought so long for. My friends died in the AIDS crisis, and my, when my friend's husband died, his family wouldn't let him take the body. Da -da 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 -da. I went just every possible grievance about – I dredged up from my past – to show how badly treated I had been as a gay man and what a terrible, horrible thing it was for these straight guys who'd never had to work for anything in their life, never had to worry about discrimination, just thought that they could appropriate my celebration. It's gross, right? I mean, it is gross. It's giving, it's giving me the willies when I, when I tell you about it. But that's not the only time I've had a histrionic meltdown. I mean, I, I have even had them at work uh, 10 or 12 years ago. I completely lost control of my emotions uh, to my shame and embarrassment uh, during a board meeting. Um, and this is actually instructive. You know how people talk about being triggered? Again, I know it's overused. I realize that it's overused. But there is actually a phenomenon of triggering. If you think of it in terms of what some people call complex post-traumatic stress disorder, so C, PTSD. And what distinguishes that from regular old post-traumatic stress disorder? Well, regular old PTSD is, uh, is what we think of when we're talking about things like a one-off traumatic event, like perhaps um, being in the building when the plane hit on 9-11 or being a soldier in a combat zone and seeing your friends die in a particularly brutal battle. These very strong, very traumatic and dramatic occurrences can leave you with uh, with a complex, right? But what's different with complex post-traumatic stress disorder, which is not in the DSM, it's been argued to be in the DSM, but there's disagreement over whether it's a, it's a valid construct on its own, but it's a helpful way to think about the kind of emotional damage that people like me and maybe some of you come away from our homes with when we're raised by cluster B parents. Complex post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms can include what are called emotional flashbacks. These are not conscious. It's not like um, a veteran might actually have a flashback where he hears a car that backfires and it sounds like a shell going off. This is where shell shocked came from. The guys who came back from World War I basically in a daze um, and, and would lose their minds, you know, whenever they heard a loud noise. They, you can actually have a flashback about the traumatic event. An emotional flashback with the complex PTSD people is is less conscious. It's an emotional flashback. It, it's you regressing in age back to a time where you had a particularly fraught emotional interaction with a parent or a caregiver. So we were having a board meeting. There was a very contentious personnel issue, and I was really nervous about it because I had some responsibility for not managing um, an employee very well. It was a complicated situation, and, and there were a lot of people who had responsibility, but some of that responsibility was mine. And I was feeling very scared and feeling called on the carpet in front of the board. I was more scared than I needed to be. Um, but I was reacting really badly uh, to the discussion that was going on. And in my mind, everybody was ganging up on me and all of this was a prelude to firing me. That wasn't true. One of my board members stopped during the meeting and said to me, can you stop with those expressions on your face? Because they're really making it uncomfortable for me and, you know, it seems inappropriate. That triggered me. Absolute. I, I lost my temper and I started crying. Embarrassing, yes. But there's a reason for it. When I was a little kid, our mother would not let us kids have our own feelings. And she would not let us display feelings if our feelings were not in, in accordance with hers. So quite literally, my mother would complain about the way I had arranged my face. If I felt she was being unfair, if I thought she was blaming me for something that I didn't do, if I objected or talked back, I would really get in trouble for it. And... She had a sadistic streak. She liked to, when she knew that one of her children was upset and angry and didn't think she was being fair, she'd say, smile, smile and say, yes, ma'am. Put that smile on your face right now, Joshua Slocum. 
And it made me furious, absolutely furious. Who the hell did this woman think she was telling me what my feelings should be and then telling me if I had unapproved feelings that I couldn't show them? Not only could I not show those feelings, but she actually got to monitor the arrangement of the muscles on my face and she compelled me to lie and say, thank you, I like it. It's sadistic. I could give you many examples. They'd get boring after a while, but this was this was a very common theme in my household. And as a result, I, I'm allergic to people when I perceive them to be policing my feelings. I, I have reacted very badly. Now, I think this, this gentleman on my board, I think he was actually a little bit out of line. I probably was displaying all sorts of emotions all over my face because I've never been able to hide my feelings. I, I work now, even now, I work on holding an impassive face, particularly in public and professional contexts, because I know that I am likely to display every fleeting emotion that comes across my brain will show up on my face. So I probably was um, looking a little bit theatrical, but I, I, I think he was out of line as well. But my, my reaction, my meltdown, uh, my embarrassing meltdown was an actual and genuine trigger. Uh, that doesn't excuse the behavior. It doesn't excuse, you know, losing my temper and crying and, and, and being kind of a baby in the boardroom. But it does explain it. And that's a concept I'd like you to carry with you. Explanations are not excuses. This is difficult for people. One of the reasons why you see people object to people like me who say, this person's acting this way because it looks like he has a pattern of cluster B type thinking and behavior. People think that you're making an excuse. So they say, oh, you're, a, you know, every time somebody's a jerk, you blame it on mental illness. And I understand where they're coming from, but they're reading it wrong. Mental illness generally invokes our sympathy lobe, right? If, if we can be said to have a sympathy lobe in our brain, the, the concept of mental illness usually invokes it. So people will often say, oh, he can't help himself, or she doesn't know any better, she can't help it, she has schizophrenia, or she has bipolar, she has this or that. There's a sympathy attached to it, and it's often used to quiet people who say, regardless, this behavior is inappropriate. We make them feel guilty by saying, basically, in... In other words, we're saying, you're picking on a poor, sick man or woman who can't help it, and you just need to forbear a little bit more. So I, would, I can understand when people hear, you know, well, this is typical behavior for Cluster B. If they don't know that there's more depth to this conversation, they hear it as an excuse, but it's not an excuse. So my histrionics, right, there is an explanation for them. But the explanation is not an excuse for my behavior afterwards. I'm still responsible for governing myself. And I don't know if this is true. It's a working theory that I have, but I haven't really checked to see if it's backed up by research or, or, or a lot of papers. But I think that some children learn histrionic emotional tantrums because they have parents like mine who did not actually pay attention to their genuine and legitimate needs. I mean, you know, my mother didn't rescue me from her husband who beat me and pushed my head into a concrete wall. Um, you know, she certainly didn't have any time for more minor complaints that I had. And when I did have these complaints, not only was I not allowed to have them, but she would make me smile and say I was happy uh, so that she could see that she had that kind of control over me. She wonders why I ended up hating her. <laughs> um, I think that I think we learn as children from parents like this that nobody is going to help you. Nobody's going to satisfy your genuine and legitimate needs unless you scream so fucking loud that everybody else's ears are going to pop. I think that's where a lot of the histrionics comes from. So again, not an excuse, but an explanation. So... We see this behavior going on all over the place. The young SJWs, particularly on social media, um, my friend describes it as emotional incontinence, and I've, I've appropriated that phrase because it's such a good one. The sort of public emoting, talking about your, your pain, your trauma, your tears, your triggers. I'm talking about my pain, my trauma, my tears, and my triggers on this show, right? 
but because I want to use them to illustrate things that I think you are going to be able to relate to, both in yourself and perhaps in other people. I'm not doing it to get attention, but a lot of people do it for attention, and it's become it, it's something that gets paid in social currency. So sometimes when you bring up the way grown adult people act on social media, people say, oh, why are you paying attention to that? They're just 15-year-olds. No, they're not. No, they're not. These are grown adults, 18, 20, 22, 25, 30, 40. How long does teenagehood last these days? Even 21-year-olds a generation ago or two generations ago were expected to be able to govern their emotions in public conversations to a much greater degree than we see these days. So if you find yourself having that reaction, oh, that's just a bunch of 16-year-olds, step back and reconsider. What if they're not actually 16? What if they're 25? Does that change your mind about whether or not this should be expected and tolerated? I think it should. And your reaction is actually reasonable because you're probably old enough to remember when it didn't used to be like this when adult behavior was held to a higher standard. This is, in fact, 15- and 16-year-old behavior. That's correct. Absolutely. But it's happening in people who are much older. And I've talked to friends about this, and I don't know how we get out of this situation. Because these younger people today, not only like all young people, not only do they not really believe the world existed before they were born, but young people today have no direct experience of the world that I grew up in when I was younger, where you had to put these things to bed when you were 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. After that, you couldn't get away with them anymore. There was social pressure, appropriate social pressure, to moderate yourself and stop throwing tantrums in public. There isn't that social pressure anymore. And their parents, I mean, where do you think these kids learned this stuff? right? Their parents didn't model any of this for them, didn't model self-control. Anytime that they said, um, oh, mommy, mommy, I need something. Help me, help me. You know, whether or not that was a real need, these helicopter parents have swooped in to fulfill that need. This is why we have moms and dads actually calling the dean at colleges and, and quibbling with the administration because, you know, Judy didn't get an A. This is ridiculous. So, this behavior has been reinforced and they never have had a role model, not in their parents and certainly not in media now, that says this is not appropriate behavior. I mean, look at the characters we see on even sitcoms these days, let alone the, the cluster B clusterfuck that is reality TV. We glorify emotional incontinence. We glorify cruelty. We glorify navel gazing. Uh, this, you know, this is just worked into the storylines that we're fed every single day. So I don't know how we get past this because it's hard enough to convince a young person that the world existed before they were born. But if you can do that, it's even harder to get them to understand that their current social mores are not, in fact, time tested. They're very recent. And they're really out of step with what everybody considered reasonable adult behavior only 20 years ago. I have an example that I want to share with you. I printed out some, some pieces from a conversation on Facebook. This illustrates two things, this example. It, it illustrates histrionics, melodramatic overdramatization, emotional inflation, but it also illustrates the fact that our social conventions now are set up to flatter people who do this, and we are expected to take a pseudo-therapeutic stance toward other people. What do I mean by that? I used to say, when I was talking to my therapist, I used to say, everybody wants us to act like someone else's therapist. We have to soothe them. We have to, and he would stop and say, Josh, no, 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 no. This is not what a therapist is supposed to do. That's not a therapeutic stance. We do not shield people from their triggers. We don't tell them to avoid places that trigger their phobias. We don't flatter every single tantrum they have because that is not therapeutic. And, and what he's saying is true. Sometimes you have to be cruel to be kind in the right measure, right? Sometimes 
the kindest thing to do for somebody that you care about is to say, okay, listen, I'll hold your hand for a second. I can see how upset you are. I get it. However, you're upset because you're thinking about this may not be as clear as it should be. We can come back to the conversation later, but, you know, this isn't helping. And in fact, you know, when I had my histrionic meltdown at work, I continued to have that tantrum talking to the woman who was the president of my board, who's also a friend. Um, And the more she listened, the angrier I got, the louder my voice got, the more I cried. And at one point she stopped and she said, okay, I'm not having this conversation anymore because I feel like I'm feeding this. You're not getting less upset as you tell me. You're getting more upset. She was right. Having an audience in a social group that either applauds you or looks on sympathetically encourages people to engage in histrionics. So here's the example. (sighs) Long, long Facebook thread about... um, trans rights, naturally, and how important it is to respect people's pronouns, because if you don't respect their pronouns, they're going to kill themselves. (laughs) You think I'm joking? Just you wait. So here is Sarah. Sarah says, I'm going to try not to bias this and, and, and mimic the voice that I'm sure Sarah has in real life. So pardon me if it creeps in a little bit. If I told you that you had the power to dramatically reduce the depression and suicide rates of a subset of the U.S. population made up of over 14 million people at zero cost to you or any other taxpayer in the country, would you do it? Good. Now shut up and use the name and pronoun people tell you they use for themselves. After all, research has demonstrated this practice significantly reduces suicide rates among trans folks. So, you know, just do the right thing. (sighs) This is emotional bullying. This is emotional grandstanding. This is somebody who wants to appear to be a savior, who cares about people more deeply than anybody else, because if she didn't care about it, if, if you actually cared about it, you'd be doing this too. And by the way, this is a classic borderline personality disorder move. If you really loved me, you'd do X, Y, and Z. Or if you really didn't want me to hurt myself, you'd do X, Y, and Z. Okay? No idea whether this person has borderline personality disorder or any personality disorder. And like I've said before, it doesn't matter. Because the behaviors are destructive no matter who engages in them. And what you see online... The, the circles that these people move in, threads like this that, you know, have a million of those tearful care react things from people, that sort of mob adoration encourages this. I don't believe that most of the people in any one grouping are personality disordered. I don't. Most people are not personality disordered. There are a lot more of them than we'd like to think. But it doesn't require everyone to be personality disordered for us to be living in a cluster B world. It only requires a couple of people who are who have developed these manipulation skills and that bamboozle other emotionally weak people or people with a weak ego structure um, who can be carried along by this and induced to, to mimic the behavior and, and to enforce it. So, so I told you what Sarah wrote here. And um, I don't actually think that I can accomplish anything by responding on these Facebook threads. I used to, but (laughs) this is purely for my own amusement. And sometimes I do it deliberately to provoke people because then their reactions are instructive and I can tell you the story. So here's what I wrote to Sarah after her, you know, just shut up and use the pronouns. Emotional blackmail, no. That was my whole post. Emotional blackmail, no. So she comes back. Fascinating, Josh, that you find facts and the opportunity to show respect to be emotional blackmail. You may want to explore why the issue of gender impacts you so deeply. (laughs) I'm sorry, but please, I mean, don't tell me that you don't hear that voice in your head because I know you do. So then Allison comes along and says, so like... You just read a thing about how treating people with basic human decency can reduce suicide rates and you're declaring it blackmail and doubling down. So like, 
Are you opposed to treating people in general with basic human decency? Or do you have a prioritized list or like what? And I just wrote again, no. (laughs) Then Kaylee comes along and says, if someone's name is Jeffrey, but they prefer to be called Jeff, do you have an issue? What about being called William or being called Bill or Richard being called Dick or Susan being called Sue? Just shut the fuck up and be respectful. Okay, sweetie. (laughs) So I wrote again, no. They hate to be told no. Why do they hate to be told no? Because they don't like boundaries. This entire new set of social conventions where everyone else's pain is supposed to be your job and your responsibility, they don't want boundaries. They don't want boundaries between your personal life and your professional life. They don't want boundaries between acquaintances. They want you to treat everybody like they were your best friend and they want to be able to use you like a doormat and and at a pot into which they can pour their unmanaged emotions. I mean, even think about bring your whole self to work. Only the millennial generation could come up with crap like that. Bring your whole self to work? If I brought my whole self to work, I would have been fired on the second day, (laughs) and rightly so. You should not be bringing your whole self to work. You should be bringing your work self to work. I don't care about your bridge club, I don't care about your grandchildren. I don't care about any of these things. I don't care about how you practice your religion. I don't need to hear about your gender or your gender identity. Nobody actually cares about that, and it's not appropriate at work. So, you know, this kind of stuff that goes on, you'll see it a lot online. And again, the takeaway is it's all cluster B type behaviors. It's borderline and histrionic behaviors, basically emotional blackmail. But it doesn't make any difference whether these people, I, you know, I'm never, I'm probably never going to see any of these people again in my life. So I haven't had the opportunity to, um, to, to see how they behave as a pattern. But there are some people that I have had that opportunity to observe. And one of them is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Let's get to her. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. I'm going to try to be fair to her and give her her due, but she is a really, really good example of a pattern of histrionic behavior that is unconnected to reality and is clearly attention-seeking. Uh, it's another example of, of that. It's, it's almost a truism. I'm going to have to find a pithy, short way to say it so that you all can remember this, but... It's an example of of what you find with people who engage in these manipulative behaviors. And and in fact, I got this from Bill Eddy, the guy in the High Conflict Institute that I I, uh, talked about a little bit earlier in the show. Bill Eddy says, with this kind of people, the issue is never actually the issue. And what that means is You could be talking to somebody who says that feeding impoverished children is their goal. You could be talking to somebody who says that getting more women into politics is their goal. You could be talking about somebody who uh, says uh, getting new engineering principles into engineering schools is their goal. It doesn't matter what the actual content is of what they're saying. If they're a manipulator this way, any topic can be used to shut you down and any topic can be used as a soapbox on which to have a histrionic psychodrama. And Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez does this constantly. She does it on Twitter. She does it online. Uh, She even does it with her face. I mean, she, you know, she's got a lot going for her. When I I was thinking about what I was going to talk about with her, my opinions are provisional. I reserve the right to change my mind. So I, I, I may change my mind about this over time. But from where I sit now, I don't think that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is actually a malicious person. Not all cluster bees are, are actively malicious. They're all manipulative. And they can all be abusive. But some of them are more consciously so than others. She, I don't think she's sadistic. I don't think she's psychopathic. Um, I think her narcissism is secondary to her to her histrionic behavior. I think she actually believes in some of the things she says. Whether or not you agree with her proposals on on minimum wage or where tax dollars should go or any of those things, fine. 
But I get the sense that she probably does believe them and it's not entirely an act. But all it's hard to tell because any of these topics, she just goes way overboard. So this week, let me get this tweet in front of me here. So you all heard about the GameStop situation where uh, some people on Reddit were um, buying up a lot of stock in the in the store GameStop. I'm not going to pretend that I know very much about this because I don't. But what happened was this apparently upset some more institutional investors and and one of the popular phone apps that that people use to do day trading called Robinhood. I, I guess put a cap on people weren't allowed to trade GameStop anymore. And people smarter than me about economics uh, have been coming out and saying this was an interference with the market. This was inappropriate, perhaps illegal behavior on Robin Hood's uh, part. Don't know if this is true, but this is the conversation. So uh, Ocasio-Cortez tweeted this about, um, about Robin Hood's actions. This is unacceptable. We need to know more about the Robin Hood app's decision to block retail investors from purchasing stock while hedge funds are freely able to trade the stock as they see fit. As a member of the Financial Services Committee, I'd support a hearing if necessary. Very reasonable statement. Um, and from my position of ignorance here, I kind of agree with her, I, if I understand this correctly. But as a matter, um, Ted Cruz came in and this was his tweet back to AOC. Fully agree. Great. This could be an opportunity for finding common ground between the left and right, you know, both someone who's conservative and someone who's a liberal who say, you know what, we all have to play by the same rules. And these guys were trying to live by double books. They had one set of rules for themselves. If I had been Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, I would have said, thank you, Ted. I appreciate it. Let's get our offices talking to each other. Maybe we can do a bipartisan hearing. (laughs) <laughs> you don't think that's how she responded, did you? So this is what she says. I am happy to work with Republicans on this issue where there's common ground, but you almost had me murdered three weeks ago, so you can sit this one out. Happy to work with almost any other GOP that aren't trying to get me killed. In the meantime, if you want to help, you can resign. <sighs> and why did she do it? She did it so she'd get this. Yes, queen! Yes, queen! She wanted attention. And she got it. And she got her yes, queen. This is ridiculous. First of all, she's been doing this all along on all the issues, but she's been particularly melodramatic about the riot at the Capitol. Yes, riot, not insurrection. There was no insurrection at the Capitol. There was criminal behavior and vandalous behavior and behavior that's, that, that did frighten people legitimately. And these people should be prosecuted. But this was not an insurrection. Trump did not incite it. And Republicans, Ted Cruz, Kevin McCarthy, whoever else AOC has in her sights are not responsible for that. To sit there, to go in public... And accuse your colleague on the other side of the aisle of trying to have you murdered. These are her words. You almost had me murdered three weeks ago. That's insane. That's not understandable. Even if you're upset, I might be able to accept that kind of comment if it had flown out of her mouth literally five minutes after the riot at the Capitol was over. Any of us can say crazy things when our emotions are running high and when we're, when you know, we're genuinely scared. I could understand that. But this is days later. This is a week later. It's more than a week later. You almost had me murdered. Yes, queen! I am so sick of this. And this is, this is something that... When I talk about the fact that people are making a good social living by using these manipulative and histrionic behaviors. This is what I'm talking about. Because this woman gets thousands and thousands of likes and yas queens and emojis of clapping hands. This is what she's doing it for. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez does not actually believe that Ted Cruz was trying to get her killed. So as much as I want to give her her due and say I think she probably believes in a lot of the policies... I don't believe for one second that she actually believes that, but she's willing to say it. 
she's willing to make that outrageous accusation just at the moment when she might actually have found a partner on the other side of the aisle to hold a hearing with or to write bipartisan legislation? No. She had to accuse him of basically, you know, plotting to murder her. It's it's ridiculous. And she shouldn't be getting claps for it. I've got a name for this, this social currency that people like her go for. They're looking for queen coins, okay? They're looking to get paid for this. And queen is spelled K-W-E-E-N, queen coins. She and her squad want queen coins. They want people to say, Yes, queen! They want to get paid in social currency. And they especially like it when they get, Yes, queen! It's nonsense. This is all nonsense. Oh, further? Because <laughs> it didn't stop with that. Cory Bush. <laughs> I'm sorry. <sighs> Let me read Cory Bush's tweet. <laughs> a mass, <laughs> a maskless Marjorie Taylor Greene and her staff berated me in a hallway. She targeted me and others on social media. I'm moving my office away from her for my team's safety. I've called for the expulsion of members who incited the insurrection from day one. And Cortez, of course, had to had to give a thumbs up to that and say, The GOP leader has a responsibility to ensure his members do not harm others. He's losing control of his caucus and allowing these threats to go unchecked. What threats? What threats? Going back to Cori Bush, a maskless Marjorie Taylor Greene. Can you imagine that kind of monster? Look at her. She was out bare-faced in public. She targeted her. With her maskless face, brazen hussy. I'm moving my office away from her for my team's safety. Oh, for God's sake. Folks, this is histrionics, okay? This, politicians have always exaggerated. They have always gone over the top. But the degree to which this behavior is applauded and expected these days has only encouraged it more. And it's really frustrating because I don't want, actually, to spend my time having to, feeling compelled to react to this stuff. I do feel compelled to react to it because it sways people. And it it really bothers me that I noticed something else when I signed back into Facebook. In my seven months away... I've become even less of a liberal than I was when I quit Facebook, and a lot of my friends were already getting upset with me because I wasn't applauding everything that liberals did. But I have noticed that I get a lot fewer likes and a lot fewer um, uh, shares, and that's fine. That's fine. I'm not going to treat social media like a popularity contest or an addiction like I used to. But friends of mine who are leftists, who are smart people, who I know, and some of them I actually love, say nothing whenever a person like me posts this stuff. They just ignore it as if it weren't representative of the party they're voting for, but it is representative of the party they're voting for. I'm not the bad guy for pointing this out. I'm not the enemy. I'm not ruining AOC's reputation. I'm not being unfair to her. I'm pointing out that this is bullshit and it's dangerous bullshit. I mean, it's it's just like the safety culture on college campuses now where people are, you know, students, be they teenagers. This week there was a, a story about the United Nations school where diplomats' kids go. Tony Posh Private School is having a meltdown right now, accusing their teachers of systemic racism and violence against them. And of course, they're not they don't actually mean violence, they mean words, you know, and they're doing it so they can get Yes, Queen. We have got to stop paying these people. We have got to stop putting up with this. We have to stop overlooking it. Where the hell are the adults? Where are the grown-ups? This kind of behavior should only be tolerated in the hallway at high school. But there don't seem to be any adults. And again, how are we going to get out of this? If we don't stand up and be the grown-ups in the room, there is nobody who's going to push back against this. So I guess... To wrap this up, what I would ask you to consider, 
Look at the histrionics that are going on. Look at the emotional manipulations. Look at the emotional blackmail. This nonsense about, you know, if you don't say somebody's pronouns, they're going to kill themselves. Uh, By the way, uh, there are people who make those threats. Do you know who they are? They're people with borderline personality disorder. Suicide threats are, they're almost diagnostic of BPD. Suicide threats to get attention. But then other people come along, whether or not they're personality disordered, and they buy into this bullshit. And they make decent people feel guilty. And I know it because I see it happen to my friends. Well, you know, I want to do my part to prevent suicide. There is nothing you can do as a person on Facebook that is going to have any bearing on whether somebody else commits suicide. Okay, I mean, outside of running an actual smear campaign to try to blacken their reputation so badly, I mean, we see that, but that's not <laughs> that's not generally just onlookers. This is SJWs. This is not your responsibility. It was never your responsibility. You're not committing a moral wrong by refusing to play this game. But if you continue to play this game and you say, "Okay, I'll say the pronoun so that you won't kill yourself," you have basically put yourself in a relationship with an unstable borderline. Okay, and it's not going to end well. Do you know how many times my mother has threatened suicide? I don't because I've lost count and yet she lives. So, folks, call histrionics what they are. Stop putting up with them and be a little bit braver. Stick your head above the parapet. Take a risk. Be the grown up. Say no. If you like what you hear, share and subscribe. You can find us on Rumble, YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.